Hummel in Chicago. And uh, we'll set you right up. We're going to take a short break, and we'll be right back. Thank you. Oh, before we do, some information up here some of you may want. Selden Society, Bowden Government by Judiciary, phone number for NOLO Press, and my radio program. And uh, for me personally, if all of the, you guys who picked up uh, Erwin Rommel, Volume 1 okay, and wait, 2. Was this the last set, or are we doing another one? Well, I don't know. I, what did you want to do? You want to have uh, Peggy and all that? Uh, uh, or you want to take a break and do seven tomorrow? Let's do seven tomorrow. Do seven. Okay, here's the drill. operated the Africa Corps in World War II and he was also the buttress of the northern France defenses of the Germans on D-Day and you will note that the Americans knowing that sent George Patton around his western flank 30 days after the D-Day invasion. Rommel accomplished a lot with limited supplies. In North Africa he basically had no quartermaster corps. When you go up against particularly government in court, you will have to do the same. Rommel taught his army to exploit his enemy's weaknesses and to use the enemy's material and tactics against them. And in court, you should do the same. Erwin Rommel didn't throw the rule book out the window. He wrote it as he went along, and that's what we endeavor to teach you. And finally, Erwin Rommel exploited every opportunity he could, and most of the opportunities he exploited were the result of excellent advance planning. And if you plan your litigation along those parameters, uh, if you plan it as a military operation, you also will probably enjoy the success that Erwin Rommel enjoyed. Once again, Michael H. Brown. All right, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I want to see how much we have learned since yesterday. Everybody hold up your weapons. Ah, uh, yes, that's what I like to see, raised bayonets, okay? Everybody hold up your ammunition clip. There we go. Excellent. Okay, that's much better than yesterday. You're halfway through basic training. Now, what I'm going to do here is I'm going to give you a couple of things to live by. Uh, there are also military principles. We're going to get back into uh, the amendments, and uh, I've got some sources for you here. And what I'm going to do is uh, I'm going to have my senior officers come up here in this order. Uh, when I'm through here on this segment, I'm going to have them come up in this order. I'm going to have Peggy Daddick first. I'm going to have Ed Gadelli second. I'm going to have James Jackson third. And I want to point out a little something. In fact, uh, I don't see James this morning. James, are you here? No, he's AWOL. He's late for formation. Well, hopefully he'll show up uh, in time. Must have overslept. Uh, <clears throat> James has a situation that dovetails exactly, we were discussing it last night, with what I was telling you is always when someone is trying to pull something on you and telling you this is what the law is and you must do it this way, I had a fellow do the same thing this morning, came up and said, hey, my lawyer told me that you have to have an attorney to conduct a deposition. And I said, well, ask him the magic question. The magic question is, What's your statutory authority? Show, me to, show it to me in a law book. Well, James Jackson has a situation, and incidentally, I, didn't also, I also did not find this out until uh, last night. Is I guess the reason that James Jackson is what he is is that he spent six years in the Marine Corps. And I didn't know that. Now, uh, 
his particular situation, which he's going to get up to tell you a little bit about, is he got out on bail and the judge told him you could make bail, therefore you have to hire a street attorney and you can't have a public defender. And all he's got to do is put in a motion for clarification, where's the statute that says I have to do this? Uh, and then the last, but absolutely not least, uh, the last uh, senior officer I'm going to have on deck here, giving you his version of things, is Harvey Wysong, a national spokesman for FIJA. Now, before I get back in through the Fourth uh, through Tenth Amendments, I want to give you three things to live by. The first is there's a 13th century English proverb that we're very, very fond of at Erwin Rommel. This is one of the reasons for the tie. This is for your battle colors. Once you feel confident, you've had enough missions under your belt. He who is feared does ever well. <laughs> uh, now, one other th another thing. Now, remember what I told you? The one thing we will not tolerate in this organization is desertion in the face of the enemy. You start a court fight, you finish it, because there's other people coming up behind you that if you drop the ball, when you're winning, and there are people who will do this, uh, you make it ten times harder for the next pro se litigant that goes into court. And the expression is this. How many people here have read Sun Tzu, The Art of War? Excellent. Okay. Now, remember the part from Sun Tzu where it says, a battlefield is a land of standing corpses. Those who are determined to live will die, and those who are determined to face death will live. It's the same way in court. If you go in there and saying, hey, it doesn't matter what you do to me, I'm not intimidated by you, and I will take you down if this goes on long enough, after a while you'll find they will respect you. In fact, in your course materials here, you'll find a case from almost 20 years ago that I did for a fellow in Terre Haute, Indiana, and I had achieved such a reputation in that particular courtroom at that particular time that when the federal judge who had tanked the guy I was working for, when he saw my name come in on a notice of appeal as next friend of a habeas corpus, he reversed himself the same day. He who is feared does ever well. Now, one of the other things you've got to be careful of, and uh, Sun Tzu is probably the best book ever written on the philosophy necessary to survive either on a battlefield or in a courtroom, never gobble proffered baits. In other words, when you see the other side looks like they're handing you something on a silver platter, be real careful, because when you're dealing with the judges and lawyers we have in this country today, you are not dealing with people who actually behave themselves according to the canon of judicial ethics or the canon of professional responsibility. You are dealing with human rattlesnakes and moral pit vipers. Never, ever let your guard down. Now. Uh, uh, there's one other book I want to acquaint you with before uh, I get back into amendments 4 through 10 that's uh, it's mandatory for your arsenal and that's Black's Law Dictionary because what you're going to find is that between Black's Law Dictionary and the rules of civil procedure that's going those two books will cover 90 percent of what you're going to run into and when I say cover 90 percent I'm talking about the basics because what you're doing here this is simply basic training. Uh, and what I told you yesterday is that I would teach you how to use the weapons. And I think I'm doing that from the feedback that I'm getting from people coming up to me uh, after the class and that sort of thing. However, one word of caution here. Uh, in 1961, I taught marksmanship at West Point. All right, most of your 1965 graduates or at least one-fourth of them, because there were four of us in the rifle pits there who taught them. I was on a temporary duty assignment from the 101st Airborne at the time. I can teach someone how to use an M14 rifle in two days. I can teach you how to use the legal system in two days, but that does not make you an expert. In other words, I can teach you the basics, I can teach you how to use the weapons, but in order to achieve proficiency, you're going to have to practice, practice, practice. And the beauty of the legal system is a lot of that practicing is simply reading. In other words, if you see something in a newspaper and you think, well, this is what they're saying, I wonder if that's actually what it is, because most newspaper writers, most journalists are not trained in law. They really don't know what they're doing. 
And so a lot of times what you'll get in a newspaper article is really not what's in the complaint itself. In fact, one of the reasons that it behooves you to write a very coherent statement of facts is because if you get a lazy newspaper reporter who wants to report on your case, you'll just copy it word for word, you know. You'll just say, well, it's alleged this and it's alleged that. So again, I would strongly suggest that when you're through here today and you have an idea of the basics of what you're going to run into, don't say, okay, I know everything there is to know, because saying that you're a marksman when you can hit somebody from five feet away with a 12-gauge shotgun, that doesn't cut it, okay? You may know how to use the weapon, but that doesn't mean you're proficient at it. Now, uh, the, uh, what I'm going to do here now is uh, I'm going to get, oh, one other thing I want to, I want to cover, too, that came up last night. Uh, I was talking to a lady last night, and uh, she was telling me, well, she had this little problem, and it was a constitutional issue because uh, they took her property uh, without due process of law. What it came out to be was that the people who took her property were not employed by any government agency. Now, let me warn you, people, and I warn you and warn you and warn you and warn you, and I'm going to warn you again. The law is not what you think it is. The law is not what I tell you it is. The law is what is in the books. The law is not what somebody else in a guinea pig seminar tells you it is. And by guinea pig seminar, I'm referring to people who give seminars running around the country saying, well, do this and that, and they've really never tried it themselves, and they're using you as a guinea pig, and if you get arrested for it, locked up for it, they'll say, I told you so. So you have got to become proficient. And if you want to become really proficient, you're going to find that a lot of your Supreme Court cases uh, were actually handled by pro se litigants. Gideon versus Wainwright, 1963, Ferretta versus California, 1975. And the reason is, is because number one, they did the work, but number two, they only had one case. They only had one subject. And what you're going to find that the legal field in many areas, it's like the Great Salt Lake, very broad. It's very impressive looking on the surface. But the fact is, is that a lot of areas of law, a couple hours a day, you can know just about everything there is to know in three weeks because it's very shallow in many areas. And if you want to become really proficient, I would suggest that you subscribe or at least read some of the law journals because you will get much better law out of the law journals and you will see what is really going on than you will out of the published opinions. Uh, case in point, which I was uh, discussing yesterday, is the uh, grand jury uh, article by Helene Schwartz from 10 American Criminal Law Review page 701 it's about a 40 or 50 page article it's tremendous now if you read the article and you read the statistics and you read the published opinions what the published opinions tells you is all oh, the grand jury is there to act as a protection between the uh, citizen and the government it's called the shield function but when you actually read the law journal articles you're fi you'll find that it's tremendous fraud because just one example which you'll also find in this book here, it's recorded. Uh, how many people have this booklet now? Oh, excellent. Okay, because I'm going to show you how to use it as a hand grenade here in a bit. What book is that? Uh, this book is the Bill of Rights Restoration Act. And of course, the last copy that I have has E. Gaudelli uh, Trucking on the back, <laughs> or E. Gaudelli and Company Trucking. And uh, I got to tell you, uh, I'm going to make uh, Ed Gaudelli Jr. Uh, stand in Article 15 for this because it's got an illustration of a cement truck on the back and his dad's company doesn't have any cement trucks. <laughs> they haul lumber and stuff, so this has got to be redone. Anyway, uh, what, uh, what you've got to do here when you're, when you're looking at any type of legal situation is you have to understand that the law is not what I tell you it is. And quite frankly, and the reason I'm bringing up the Law Journal article a bit is it isn't what the federal judges are telling you it is in their own published opinions. Like the, for example, and let me compare this, which you will see, uh, there's another real good article called um, The Defense Attorney's Role in Plea Bargaining in the 1975 uh, Yale Law Journal, page 1179. But let me just give you an example. You read all the published opinions, and they give you all this drivel about how the members of the grand jury are supposed to protect the public, and they are supposed to operate independently of the prosecuting attorney and the judge. But in real life, and you'll see it in your booklet under the Fifth Amendment, for one example, in 1991, there were 785 grand juries convened in the United States. Federal prosecutors brought them almost 27,000 indictments, 
and only 16 times did the grand jury return a no bill. And the author of the book, uh, Burnham, Secret Deals and Political Fixes of the Justice Department, pointed out that the odds are that some of those were funny because, for example, in one, uh, there was one particular case, excellent book, by the way, I would strongly recommend you, uh, if you don't buy a copy, get it at the public library, uh, Burnham, you'll see them in, in your handbook. But what, uh, what Burnham pointed out was, when he get, after he gave the statistics, he said these 16 are very questionable because one of them he found out about was the grand jury was going to indict, I believe it was Senator Charles Robb from Virginia. I think there was something about uh, he had wired the governor's car. In other words, it was a federal criminal offense, wiretapping. And uh, anyway, people came from the Justice Department to talk the grand jury out of indicting him. And let me warn you, you know, that's called jury tampering. Any place I ever heard of it. Um, let's see here. We've got, uh, okay, so the last thing here that I've, I've got to cover, because and in case this sounds a little disjointed, is because what I do mostly on these seminars is I give you the basics, but then what I do is when people bring things up that I have to think about, and I've got to warn you something else about thinking, okay? You've got to think your way th through these situations. Even among members of the bar, you're going to have two basic types of people. And we're not talking about the sellout artists, we're talking about the ones who actually do the job, you know, the, <clears throat> which is a very large percent of them. I think it's about 3% up in, or somewhere in that neighborhood now. Uh, but if you have a good one, you have what are called racehorses and draft animals. Now, a racehorse is a guy who can get up in court, and he's fast on his feet, he's quick, uh, he can, you know, really move around a courtroom, he can convince a jury, uh, he can spar with the judge and the other attorney and so forth and so on. Most of the time, a racehorse is no good at paperwork. Someone who does the paperwork, who plows up one furrow and down the other and then up the other furrow again, that's a draft animal. And if it's done properly, the draft animals always win. And that's what you're going to have to learn how to become. And what I was, the point I'm trying to make here, rather circuitously, or however you pronounce that word, is that you cannot assume not even for a second, that your version of the law is what you're going to apply to your case. Because even someone with years and years of experience, and I've been doing this well over 20 years, what you find is your memory plays tricks on you. So when you get ready to lay something out, and you've made an assumption that, well, this is a constitutional issue because they took my property without due process, then it turns out that who took your property wasn't employed by any state or federal agency and they took your property without due process, I got a flash for you. You know, that's just simple armed robbery or theft or fraud and conversion. It has absolutely nothing to do with the constitutional issue. The Constitution, the Bill of Rights was designed not to protect us from criminals, but to protect us from government. Uh, you will never find any large criminal organization in the United States, the Mafia, uh, the Aryan Brotherhood, uh, the, the four major motorcycle clubs in the United States, uh, the Jamaican posses, uh, <clears throat> the black gangs out of Chicago. You will never find any large criminal organization that makes any effort or lobbies or whatever to disarm the rest of us. They just don't care, all right? And you're going to find a lot of times the people in the federal and state prisons are better people than the people in the federal and state legislature, legislatures and judiciary and executive branch. I don't think I have to tell you, there's never been any criminal organization in the United States that has burned 86 people to death like they did in Waco. So again, you've got to make sure that what you're doing is what the courts are going to recognize. If you say that, well, this bank clipped me for uh, <clears throat> you know, $100,000, and it's a constitutional issue because they did it without due process, uh-uh, that's, that's just simply uh, fraud and conversion. You've got to make sure you're on sound legal footing. And one of the ways you can do that, which I did not cover yesterday, is there are two sets of books that you'll find in any well-equipped law library, and they, they're, they're these two here, Amjur Second and CJS. Now what these are, these are digests, and every state will have something similar. This is American Jurisprudence, second series. It's a series of green books, Corpus Juris Secundum, 
a series of blue books. And what you'll find is when you zero in on a particular area of law, parent and child, divorce and, and uh, settlement, uh, crime, judiciary and judicial procedure, they will cover all the federal and state law literally for the last century for the entire country. And then once you have the basic principles in your head, then what you do is you go to what are called the state digest. In Missouri, for example, they're called Vernon's Annotated Missouri Statutes. In Texas, that's still Vernon's. Uh, North Dakota, it's the Century Digest. Every state has a digest. And what you do is you simply go to the index and you read the one paragraph outlines of each case and say, yeah, I think this principle fits my case. You then pull the entire case and then you shepherdize it. And, the sh and shepherdizing and everything else is in your course material. It's in chapter four. Uh, I don't want to be redundant because what I'm hoping is once you've got the basics, then you will continue your education. You will try to become more proficient with the weapons. Let me get into uh, amendments four and ten. And whatever you do, do not allow me to forget uh, to cover all this other stuff I've got up here because some of this is, uh, is fairly critical. Now, let's go back to the Fourth Amendment. You're going to find Amendment 4, uh, search warrants, uh, police seizing things they don't have any business seizing. Uh, I know the cops get blamed for everything, but the fact is a judge is supposed to make a determination, not act as a, uh, a rubber stamp. And so most police officers have no real training in law as far as what the rights of citizens are, because I don't think their superiors want them to know. <coughs> But you'll find a tremendous amount of litigation under the Fourth Amendment. Uh, primarily, uh, you'll have uh, law enforcement officers either doing the Rodney King routine on somebody or walking off with things that aren't on the warrant. In other words, if you have a warrant that lists three separate things and the police walk out with four, they've just violated the Fourth Amendment and that, vi that particular violation leaves them open to a federal civil rights action with the exception if something's obviously illegal that isn't going to fly even if you can get in front of a jury. Now the Fifth Amendment, there are two areas here that are, are ripe for litigation. One is due process and the other is the takings clause. That's the last clause in the Fifth Amendment. Now bear in mind that due process you also have uh, the same clause along with equal protection in the Fourteenth Amendment. You use the Fifth Amendment due process for federal cases, you use the 14th Amendment due process for state cases. And if you want to know what due process is, it starts off with notice and an opportunity to be heard. If some administrative agency decides to do something to you and take something away from you, and they didn't bother to, to uh, send you a notice and allow you to show up and give your side of it, that's a due process violation. Again, you've got you've to read read and read again that's how you become proficient or one of the ways you don't necessarily have to make 500 court appearances like the daddics you know who've done a lot of reading anyway uh, but what you'll find is is and I'm not going to cover the rest of due process for one very simple reason is that Black's Law Dictionary has half a page of it and if you want to learn what due process is you not only read it in Black's Law Dictionary but you go back and read it again and then you go back and read it again because when you're dealing with law, just like you're dealing with firearms, it takes practice to become proficient. The second part of the uh, Fifth Amendment that is ripe for litigation is called the Takings Clause. No person can be deprived of life, liberty, or property without due process of law. And what that means is, is that somebody can't just walk in your house who is employed by a government agency. Again, these amendments were designed to protect us from government, not to protect us from criminals. You want to protect us from criminals? That's what firearms are for. Uh, but the takings clause, when somebody walks out of your house with something, for example, let's say you have an FBI agent. He walks into your house, and he sees something that he likes, and he picks it up. Now, the real, uh, a lot of uh, law enforcement officers are uh, real fond of walking into a place and walking out with any large amounts of cash they can find. You know, this is especially true at the federal level because they figure, you know, if they got the money, you can't hire a lawyer and you can't prove it. Well, what, what happens in a case like that is that would come under the takings clause. It wasn't on the warrant. They had no right to it. And so they've left themselves wide open at the federal level 
for a 1331, at the state level for a 1983. Now the Sixth Amendment, this is a cute one, because see the Fifth and Sixth Amendment were primarily designed to protect people's rights in criminal proceedings. And uh, there's an example of judicial construction here that those of you who have son of Erwin Rommel will uh, become very familiar with, in which the Supreme Court changed the meaning of the word assistance of counsel from family or friends to someone who is a member of the bar. And then in 1963, in Gideon versus Wainwright, the Supreme Court held you could not adjudicate a criminal case unless the uh, defendant had someone who was a member of the bar defending you. And this is a real cute little trick because here's what happens. 999 times out of 1,000, when you get a, um, uh, a court-appointed attorney, he's got 50 open cases, which means if he's conscientious, he's got 45 minutes every other week to put in on your case. And if you're coming up to trial in 30 days, that means he's got approximately uh, three hours to prepare for a three-week three trial. So what you do is, is when they assign you one of these public defenders and you see he's not doing the job, you put in a motion to dismiss for ineffective assistance of counsel. And then he'll bail out. And then you do the same thing to the next one. And eventually one of two things will happen. The whole system will throw up its hands in disgust and, and just let you out of the jackpot or they will assign a public defender who understands, as the ones who just bailed out previously did, that they're being set up for an action for legal malpractice. I mean, you can actually use, it's kind of like legal judo, you can actually use this system, the strength of this system, against itself. Now, the Eighth Amendment, uh, which you can litigate there, and this also applies to the states through this ad hoc patchwork uh, method that the Supreme Court has done of applying the Ten Amendments to the states. When the Fourteenth Amendment was enacted, the intention of the people in Congress when they put it on the state ballots was to make all the Ten Amendments mandatory on the states. And you'll find if you go back through uh, the, the history of the Supreme Court, every time Congress or the people amending the Constitution did something good, the Supreme Court did something bad to try to take it away from us. But anyway, this, this applies to the states and the reason I've got due process under the Eighth Amendment, the reason that you don't, uh, you will not find those words there is this, is that when you're arrested and they put you in a cockroach infested jail cell with a toilet that's overflowing and they make you sleep on the floor and there's, there's mice and cockroaches running over your feet at night and you've got one blanket and you're shivering uh, and you're thinking, oh, you know, this is excessive punishment. Well, not until you're convicted. And this is where they trap a lot of people. The excessive punishment clause of the Eighth Amendment only applies after you have been convicted. If they're treating you like a dog before you've been convicted, it's due process. Be real careful with that because they will mousetrap you on that one. Now, Amendments 9 and 10, uh, those particular amendments, and I'm not going to cover them too thoroughly because uh, Ed Godelli is handling that operation uh, both here and in Pennsylvania. But when the 17th Amendment went in, when the state legislatures were no longer able to control the United States Senate, the 9th and 10th Amendments went out. There's, there's no longer any way to enforce them. Uh, let's see here. I've got, okay, one other thing I want to I point out uh, on books that you should have. Blackstone's Commentary. I believe Ambassador Fox is hiding behind that uh, thing back there. Uh, but Blackstone's Commentary is the one book that will give you a very good foundation on the English common law so that what you can do is you can lay out Blackstone's commentary, you can lay out the Constitution of the United States, especially the Bill of Rights, and you can see by comparing one to the other what was actually meant in 1791 when it was enacted. Now, the reason I have the Bill of Rights Restoration Act here and the reason <clears throat> that I'm, uh, how much are you selling these for, Peter? Well, to the seminar attendees.
At the moment with these, in addition to trying to wake up their fellow citizens, is because there is a statute in here that would allow us to stop all this nonsense of the courts rewriting our Constitution, which I'm not going to go heavily into the statute because you know, most of you have the booklet already, is what we've got people doing is sending copies of this booklet to their congressmen and say, we want this thing enacted. And when, uh, when enough, Congress gets hit with enough of these, and it's kind of funny, you know, people think Congress... is the unabashed greed of doctors. I thought lawyers and judges were bad enough and cable operators, but now we got ambulance operators, doctors, and hospitals. Uh, you know that Franklin got a notice from Medicare that they were that the hospital charges were fifty eight thousand dollars and Medicare paid 57000 of it. And uh, we protested that in that long letter that we read you. I think it was 20 pages. Okay. Now here comes another notice from Medicare Franklin. And this one is for uh, just a minute. I'll find the dates that are on here somewhere. This is a summary, Franklin, of claims processed from September the 11th, World Trade Center, 2002 through October the 11th, 2002. And this is from Empire Medicare Services, Post Office Box 2280, Peekskill, New York, 10566. And it's to Franklin Buell, PO Box 416, White Plains, New York. Help stop fraud, CMS Medicare summary notice says. Beware of telemarketers or advertisements offering free or discounted Medicare items and services. Part B, medical insurance, assigned claims. Dates of service, services provided, amount charged, Medicare approved, Medicare paid the provider, and you may be build. Here you are for the first one, Franklin. Uh, Ashok Shah. He's the guy who tried to talk me into agreeing that Franklin had kidney failure. Franklin did not have kidney failure, and I know that fully well. And I kept telling him that. But He's in Poughkeepsie at 68 West Cedar Street. And he was referred by Dr. Ashka M. Anwar. I never saw the man, did you, Franklin? Mm -hmm. And we have uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7 phony trumped up uh, services, so called, of Dr. Shah. And Dr. Shah wants $542.98. And Medicare allowed him to get $542.98. They approved that much. But they paid him $434.38 and left Franklin to pay $108.60. Shock Shah again on August the 21st. Subsequent hospital care. What did he do, Franklin? He came in and said hello. What did he do for you? Okay. He did nothing, and he charged $55.35 for that. And Medicare approved that, and Medicare paid him $44.28. And they want you to pay $11.07. Don't pay it. Now, we're 
to Daniel M. Katz, 1 Columbia Street, Poughkeepsie, New York, referred by Dr. James M. Scaduto. Scaduto we've heard of. Right, Franklin? Yeah. On August the 16th, which is the day after they uh, kidnapped you and took you to the hospital, uh, Dr. Katz charged one initial inpatient consult, $200. Isn't that outrageous? Yeah. I don't even remember the man, do you? No. Medicare approved 98. Medicare paid him 79. And they want Franklin to pay 1976, 19.76. Do you want to go on with this list of no, pirates? Just more of the same, I guess. Hudson Valley Critical Care Physicians. Uh, Michael C. Maranca, uh, he wants for an insertion of a chest tube. The camera said no. I asked Franklin if he wanted to hear any more of this. He said no. Uh, this is not a bill. Do not pay it. It says Franklin. And we were with uh, Michael C. Maranca when we ran out of battery. And he charged $576 uh, for putting a tube into Franklin's chest uh, because uh, the doctor, I think it was uh, Philbin, when he put the instrument in for the pacemaker, he put it in too far and pierced the lung. And so for, therefore Franklin had to have this tube inserted and this machine hooked up to him for another eight days so his lung wouldn't collapse. And then uh, referred by Dr. Daniel Chaburi, and Franklin and I don't know who he is, but they ran up a bill for $570 for an insertion of a chest tube, uh, which they made necessary. And a Medicare approved 186, paid 149, and they want Franklin to pay 37 dollars. Hudson Valley Emergency, uh, Poughkeepsie, Dr. Leroy Phillips, uh, 256 dollars he charged, and uh, Medicare approved 96 dollars, paid him 76 dollars, and now the balance for Franklin to pay is. $19. Uh, Dr. Brian C. Yen, we don't know any of these people, folks. <laughs> we never saw them. We don't even know who they are. Do you know who they are, Penny? Uh, he wants uh, $587 for two x-rays. Medicare approved $20 and uh, gave him 16 Retraction, retraction, correction. He wants $87. Medicare approved 20, paid him uh, 16, leaving $4 for Pr Franklin to pay. Uh, Donald uh, Lean, we don't know him either. Two chest x rays for $67. Medicare paid uh, $750. And leaving a balance of a dollar and eighty-eight cents. Dr. Benjamin Seckler, and referred by Dr. Mark R. Brady, whom we don't know. Another chest X-ray. Uh, Thirty-three dollars and fifty cents. Uh, Medicare approved. Nine dollars. Paid seven dollars. Leaves a balance of a dollar eighty-eight. That's page two out of six. How much more of this do you want to hear, Franklin? Franklin says you didn't want to. X-rays were all taken by people. By hospital people? Mm -hmm. Not according to this. They look to me like they're outsiders. But you think they were all hospital people? Oh, okay. They were ordered by doctors. Is that what they mean? Page three out of six, we have Dr. James Scaduto referring uh, Dr. Brian Yen 
to take an x-ray for $33, Medicare paid seven, leaving $1.88. Uh, Scaduto uh, asked Amatuli, Dr. Philip Amatuli, to take an x-ray for $33, Medicare paid seven, leaves a balance of $1.88. Dr. Brian C. Yen, we don't know these people, we know Scaduto, but that's all, took an x-ray uh, for $33, Medicare paid seven, and Franklin has a balance of $1.88. Referred by Dr. James M. Scaduto, Dr. Donald C. Lean. That's what they're trying to get, Frankie, is a lean against you. Uh, one chest x-ray, $33. Medicare approved zero. Isn't that interesting, Franklin? They approved zero. And let's see what their notes say. F and E. Are you ready for this, Frankie? Mm -hmm. All right. What the notes say? F and E. F and E. Let me find the notes, for, uh, folks. They're very interesting, the notes. Mm -hmm. Well, yes, but there wasn't any battery in the camera. Franklin says you read them once, there wasn't any battery in the camera. F and E. Okay, this is why you don't pay this, Franklin. The information provided does not support the need for similar services by more than one doctor during the same time period. So you see it's an out-and-out -out ripoff. It's a sham. The service cannot be paid when provided in this location or facility. So they caught him. Okay, Frankie? They caught him. So that's F and E, and there's two F and E's on this page. Hudson Valley Radiology, I guess they call their nickname is R-A-D, spell it with a B, B. Uh, referred by Dr. James Scaduto, Dr. Henry Fisher, one chest x-ray, one chest x-ray, $67, Medicare approved 38, paid 15, leaves a balance of 375, and we're up to page four out of six. So uh, two more x-rays, folks, by Dr. Antonio. Let me read the doctors for you. Dr. Jack Hentel. We don't know any of these people. We know James Scaduto. That's about it. Dr. Brian Yen. All x-rays, x-rays. Every day, two, three times a day, they get their exercise by running up a bill. All of this was totally unnecessary. Franklin was kidnapped. He was kidnapped and taken to Vassa Hospital. And he was held captive for 10 days. Here's an initial hospital care by whom? Uh, Kuram Ashraf. Don't know him. Charged $200. Did you ever see Kuram Ashraf, Franken? He doesn't know. $156 approved, 124 paid, leaving 31 Now, as I say, this is not a bill. Don't pay it. It's a notice. Taconic cardiothoracic again for uh, referred by James Caduto. Peter Dr. Peter Zakow. Five hundred dollars. Medicare says allowed zero of it. Good for you, Medicare. Paid zero of it, leaving a balance of zero of it, and the reasons are G and E. Let's find G and E folks. You know what E is? Uh, it appears that you did not know that we would not pay for the service, so you are not liable. Did you hear that, Frankie? Mm -hmm. He's not liable. And do not pay your provider for this service. And now, that's E. What was the other one, folks? F? G. G. Thanks. This service cannot be paid when provided in this location. So where were we? Four? Page four, Frankie? So they didn't get away with that one. You know, I thought these people were all being nice to Frankie. And that they uh, concerned and that they loved him. But all it was was a factory, an industry. Collect as much money as you can. And here's the last page five. Out uh, of six. Uh, Scaduto again, Zacco again. 
$250 for subsequent hospital care, what do they do? They come in and say, how are you today? That's fine. Goodbye. $250. That's what's making you cough, Frankie? Again, uh, Chabori. Do you remember anybody named Chabori, Franklin, Dr. Chabori, uh, Scaduto? $250. What do they do for you for $250? Uh, James M. Scaduto and uh, Dr. Daniel Chabori. $325 for observation, hospital, the same date. Well, they charge more if they go twice in the same day, Franklin? $325.114 allowed by medical care, 107 paid, and 26 left for Franklin to pay. Now, folks, don't you think that's interesting? Effective with Medicare summary notices dated January 1, 2003 or later, the time limit to request an appeal of a claim decision will be reduced from six months to 120 days. Who pays? You pay, report Medicare. You who pays? You pay. Report Medicare fraud by calling 1-800-447-8477. I think this whole thing is fraudulent. Franklin just wanted to go home. You have the right to make a request for an itemized statement which details each Medicare item. New York law limits physicians' bills to 105% of the approved amount for most services. This law does not apply to code so-and-so, so-and-so for office visits and for home visits. These may be billed at the Medicare limiting charge. If you have any questions about those limits, all calls concerning the or calls concerning the uh, New York state law must be directed to our dedicated professional staff at 1-800-442-8430. Appeals information part B. If you disagree with any claims decision on this notice, you can request an appeal by April the 11th, 2003. Follow the instructions below. Circle the items you're, you disagree with and explain why you disagree. Send this notice or a copy to the address in the customer service information box on page one. Sign here. So you have until April, Franklin. Learn about programs that can put money back in your pocket. Do you need help paying the $54 Medicare Part B monthly premium? By the way, Franklin, they say here a notice that you have paid your deductible for the year 2002. Are you an individual with a monthly income of less than $1,000 or a couple with a monthly income of less than $1,300? If so, and you live in New York State, we have great news for you. Thanks to recent changes in New York State law, you may be able to save $54 a month. Call the toll-free helpline at 1-800-541-5400. And ask how you can apply for the Medicare Savings Program. What is the Privacy Act and how does it affect you? The Privacy Act of 1974 is a law designed to ensure confidentiality and protect your rights and information. It applies only to federal agencies and their agents, such as Empire Medicare Services. Did you know that Empire Medicare Services is an agent, Franklin? Medicare Part B Medical Insurance. Medicare assignment, your responsibility. You are responsible for an annual deductible, the first $100 of Medicare Part B approved charges each calendar year. What do they do, take it out of your Social Security? How do they get the $100? When other in yours is paid and you didn't pay it. 
when other insurance pays first, your right to appeal, help stop Medicare fraud. Fraud is a false representation by a person or business to get Medicare payments. Some examples of fraud include offers of goods or money in exchange for your Medicare number. Oh, be careful of that. <coughs> Telephone or door-to-door -door offers of free medical services or items and claims for Medicare services or items you did not receive. Oh, insurance counseling and assistance. Insurance counseling and assistance programs are located in every state. Do you think that was interesting, folks? Okay, let's have some jokes. A ship carrying a load of red paint collided with a ship carrying a load of purple paint, and at last report, the crews of both ships were marooned. Computers are in the Bible. Eve said to Adam, do you want an apple too? And baseball is in the Bible too. Why, Franklin? Because it says in the big inning. And the poor little tailor was not doing well. He was practically starving to death. And his minister says, why don't you take the Lord as your partner? And the tailor did. And the tailor began to prosper. And he did very well. And this minister said, you see what happens when you take the Lord as your partner? And the tailor says, look, we got stores everywhere. We got branches all over. We got trucks all over. There goes one of our trucks right now, Lord and Taylor. Why was six mad at seven? Because seven, eight, nine. Japanese man went to the eye doctor, and the eye doctor said to the Japanese man, you have cataracts. And the Japanese man said, I do not. I have a Lincoln town car. And why do firemen always have a Dalmatian dog? Why do firemen always have a Dalmatian dog? So they can go ahead and find the fire hydrant. Now, Ethan Bond, Jr., Ethan Book, Jr., lives in Fairfield, Connecticut. I met him at the rally against the Second Circuit uh, at Foley Square in Manhattan. And uh, he has been abused by courts, by judges, by lawyers, by the police. And he is standing up against that. And he's doing a great job. He sent me his letter uh, to uh, Governor Rowland and said that neither Rowland of Connecticut nor his opponent had on their platform anything for judicial reform. We need judicial reform. Uh, and he also sent uh, the uh, uh, paper by uh, Dr. Uh, Hartman, was it? Uh, just a minute, I should find that for you. Heckman. H-E-C-K-M-A-N, Dr. Heckman. Uh, what's wrong with the courts, and what do judges do wrong? I've read that to you in full. And now, here's a judicial court reform uh, for the state of Oklahoma, and it's an executive order that these people have got together as of July 8, 2002, for, to be signed and made into law. Whereas the Oklahoma State Senate recognizes that there is a great need to thoroughly analyze and reform laws, rules, procedures, statutes, codes, canons, and titles governing the administration of our courts in this state. There is hereby created a citizen's task force to conduct such a review. Sounds good, doesn't it? The task force will become effective on July 15, 2002. It will be charged with conducting the research necessary to submit recommendations to the Oklahoma legislature on this issue. Let's do this in New York. Let's do this in Connecticut. Let's do this in New Mexico. Let's do this in Oregon. Let's do this in Buffalo, New York. Let's do this in 
uh, Bergen County, New Jersey. Let's do this. Did I say Connecticut? Did I, Franklin? Yeah. The task force will perform the following duties and be governed by the following stipulations. Service of all laws, or rather, review all laws, rules, procedures, statutes, codes, canons, and titles regarding the need for court reform and make recommendations to the legislature concerning changes in the same. Two, explore the uh, promotion of greater equity in the administration of our courts and justice for all in the state of Oklahoma. Review the judicial system's role in this issue and make recommendations addressing the need by, for reform of the administration of justice for all. Four, review the legal and judicial system including involvement of the Oklahoma Bar Association of fraud, cover-up, and or corruption. That's where a lot of the corruption comes from, the bar associations and the bench. And where are you? Out there someplace. The president pro temporary of the Senate shall support the members including a chairman excuse me, shall appoint the members, including the chairman and co-chairman of the task force, with the total task force to not be more than 10 members. The task force shall be eligible for mileage and per diem. Reimbursement at the approved state rate. The task force shall make it a report to the president pro temporary and the full Senate and House of Representatives no later than, now this is a, an executive order that the people in Oklahoma want signed and enacted, and the full Senate and House of Representatives no later than January 15, 2003. It shall also present its findings to the Senate Judiciary Committee by no later than February 15, 2003, dated the 8th day of July, 2002, Signed, Stratton Taylor, President Pro Tempore. Brought to you by, you want to get a pencil? H, T, T, as in Tom, P, Paul, slash, slash, www.tulsa.org, slash, dads. Broadcasting live, the new Judicial Reform Talk Show, Crusade Radio, Mondays, 6 p.m., Tulsa time, Central. And here's the site for that. H, double T is in Tom, P, Paul, slash, slash, www.crusader. Radio, but not two R's. C R U S A D E D E R A D I O dot com. To be removed, reply to small to uh, email or unplug your computer. Seven twenty two two America Online, New England. Limo, page five. Isn't that great? Thank you, Ethan Book, Jr. You should get a public access show, Ethan, and you should do all these things. You have superb uh, things to present to the public. But I know you're either too lazy to do it, or you're too poor to do it, or you're too busy to do it, or you're too shy to do it. But you should have a public access program and bring these gems to the public. Isn't that so, folks?
And Harry said to God, How much is a million dollars to you, God? And God said, Ten dollars. And Harry says, Well, God, how long is a million years to you? And God said, One second. And Harry says, God, could you loan me ten dollars? And God said, Certainly, just a second. legally deaf that a judge in conspiracy with uh, friends in the on the bench evicted this poor lady and he has pictures of it and she became a ward of the state And her name is Rod Heek Rishi. Let me show it to you. It's against her husband, and it's a divorce case. And uh, George McDermott uh, sat at her so-called trial and watched her due process denied repeatedly and made uh, a report on it and sent it to the clerk to be filed. And let me show you some pictures of this poor woman uh, sitting out on her lawn. They broke down her door. Uh, the police and the misguided law enforcement broke down her door and put the poor woman, evicted her, and here she sits on her lawn, disabled, blind, deaf, without a home, and without all of the things that she owned in her home. And this is the ring that I've told you about many times. Crooked lawyers, corrupt judges, and dirty landlords. Now this is George McDermott's truck which tells people that we are losing what we have because of judicial tyranny. And I'll show you a better picture of that truck later. And here's a picture of her things being taken out of her house and just dropped George McDermott, this is in Maryland, a great soldier for justice and knowing fully well that we don't get this today. So here's his truck. And it says, McDermott, join McDermott, working with you to improve your courts our courts. Let us make Prince George County a model for justice. This is in Maryland. Judicial terrorists are destroying our nation. What are you doing about this? Go to www.fraudvictim.org Now, this is George's petition for writ of certiorari in the Supreme Court of the United States. 
he paid $300 to file this. This is why I can't go to the Supreme Court of the United States anymore, because I don't have $300. The Supreme Court of the United States is for rich people. It is not for poor people. And in addition to that, he paid $1,500 to have this printed. Now, this is about bankruptcy. George had a business, and he had a crooked partner. And the crooked partner stole the money. And George went bankrupt, and he went to the bankruptcy court. And the crooked partners uh, knew people in the bankruptcy court. In fact, I think they were uh, related by marriage. Uh, the crooked partner and the judges. And uh, the name of the case is George E. McDermott versus Andrew Clifford Moore. And the bankruptcy court, as we know in the case of Bill Budrow, uh, did all kinds of things that were denial of due process, denial of constitutional rights, denial of statutory rights. Uh, I'm going to name you some names. Okay, Glendora, let's do better than that. I'm going to present to you some names for you to remember as being very crooked. Judge Paul Manis. Uh, he denied uh, George's motions. Uh, Peter Parker, Wayne A. Bowie, Andrew Clifford Moore, Crystal Skates Limited Partnership and Crystal, Crystal Skate of Maryland Incorporated. So these are the bad people. And they have done George and his wife tremendous harm. I just started reading it. I would like to point out to you Title 42 U.S. Code Section 1983 civil actions for deprivation of rights. These came out after the Civil War. Every person who, under color of any state uh, statute, ordinance, uh, regulation, custom, or usage of any state or territory or District of Columbia subjects or causes to be subjected, any citizen, now that's you, of the United States or other person within the jurisdiction thereof to the deprivation of any right to privileges or immunity secured by the Constitution and laws shall be liable to you, you the party injured, in an action of law, suit in equity, or other proper proceedings for redress. That's the old famous civil rights. And 1985 is under conspiracy. I'm sure these people have conspired against you. And uh, 1986, action for neglect to prevent. Uh, if a person, well, I better read it. Every person who having knowledge that any of the wrongs conspired to be done and mentioned in 1985 of this title are about to be committed and having the power to prevent or to aid in preventing the commission of the same and neglects or refuses to do so, if such wrongful act to be committed shall be liable to the party injured or his legal representatives for all damages caused by such wrongful act which such person by the reasonable diligence could have prevented such damage may be recovered in an action on the case and any number something our person something is guilty of such wrongful neglect or refusal may be joined as defendants in the action very good for you to know this right, isn't it? Read Title 42, the United States Code. Sections 1983, 1984, 1985, 1986. Uh, 1984 is pro se. No, excuse me. Let me withdraw that, please. 
Uh, Title 28 U.S. Code, Section 1654, is pro se. In all courts of the United States, the parties may plead and conduct their own cases personally or by counsel, and by rule of such courts, respectively, are permitted to manage and conduct cases therein. And then in common law, in suits and common law, where the value in the controversy exceeds $20, the right of trial by jury shall be preserved, and no fact tried by jury shall be otherwise re-examined in any court of the United States. It's a good book, isn't it? Now, this is written by George McDermott in Maryland who was double-crossed by his partners, was cheated, who went to court for justice and, didn't, and was double-crossed by the court. This is Glendora, chat with Glendora. I keep the courage flaming. Did you hear about the three ropes that were walking down the street? And they went into the restaurant, and they sat down to order, and the head waiter says, wait a minute, you're ropes, we don't serve ropes in here, you'll have to leave. And out on the street, one rope became very, very angry, and he tied himself into a knot, and he tossed with both of his hands. He went back into the restaurant, he sat down, and he started to order, and the head